All right, so we are going to get into signaling pathways and specifically look at feedback mechanisms. So we can look at um, cellular molecular level signal transduction pathways, um, how hormones work, and that's going to be another video or two focusing on G protein or tyrosine kinase receptors and, and the different types of signal transduction pathways that help that happen on a cellular molecular level. But this video is focusing more on tissue or system level response to stimuli. So when we start looking at systems, we might be thinking about the nervous system or endocrine system. And again, I'll have another video about <clears throat> the nervous system. But one area in particular we start thinking about is up in your brain. What is the connection between your nervous system, which is constantly receiving stimuli, and then how we can respond to stimuli through the nervous system as well and through muscle contraction, but we also respond through the endocrine system and hormones through your blood and responding to stimuli in that way. So the hypothalamus is up in your brain and it is kind of the bridge to your endocrine system via the pituitary gland, which hangs right in the middle of your brain. So that's going to start um, sending hormones to different areas of your body. So again, we are fo focused on this system or tissue level response to stimuli now. And responding to stimuli is all about maintaining homeostasis, and homeostasis is a steady state. So through negative feedback, we maintain the range of a lot of things that your body is constantly measuring or monitoring, like blood sugar, cholesterol, blood pH, calcium, blood pressure. All of these things are constantly being monitored and have to stay within a range. Otherwise, you would die, basically. And people are often prescribed drugs to maintain the range in case when your body is not able to um, manage negative feedback efficiently or properly. If your blood sugar is always high, then you have to take drugs to help bring it back down and maintain the range because your if your body if you become diabetic, your body is no longer maintaining homeostasis on its own. So negative feedback. A big thing when you hear negative feedback is you need to think about maintaining a range. If it things get too high, you bring it down. If it's too low, you bring it back up. Little variations, again, things aren't perfectly like flat lined ever. They're all, always in a constant flux of going up and down. So um, we need to maintain normal limits. And when it gets outside those normal limits, we trigger a response. So how do we end up modeling the system when we look at tissue level signal pathways? A lot of times we have some type of a receptor that's focused on um, a homeostatic range. In this instance, it's showing it, it gets too high and it goes above the range. Then we have a responder or effector, some mechanism that kicks in that will bring it back down. And that what it caused it to come back down is the response. Again, if it, we start getting it back inside the range, but what happens if it goes down? Now, again, we have another negative feedback mechanism that responds or the effector that brings it back within the range. So you see this like hourglass model a lot when you start talking about negative feedback. One example would be um, body temperature. Your hypothalamus is monitoring. It's a receptor um, that's monitoring your body temperature. Now, if you, your body temperature gets too hot, you have effectors or responders like capillaries and sweat glands, which respond through vasodilation and sweating to bring it back within the range. Now, if you get too cold, again, you have muscles and capillaries that are effectors that are going to cause vasoconstriction and shivering to end up bringing your body temperature back up to the correct range. Again, another example is blood pressure. You have baroreceptors, which are monitoring the degree of stretch in the walls of expandable organs. So you're in this area here. If it starts, your blood pressure gets too high, you have your heart and capillaries, which decrease the cardiac output. It decreases heart beats. The heart beats fewer times per minute with less intensity. And your capillaries get wider in order to lower. Um, your blood pressure. Now, if your blood pressure gets too low, again, heart and capillaries get going on here, get 
kicked in and they cause vasoconstriction. If the capillaries get narrower, you're going to increase the pressure. You're going to increase the cardiac output. Your heart's going to beat more often with more intensity to bring your blood, blood, blood pressure back up. Now, when we start getting into um, signal transduction, this is an incredibly complicated process. Now, we do have huge systems like from your liver and your kidneys, you're releasing different chemicals here, different chemicals here that have to get turned on, which turns this into another form of the chemical, which go up to your lungs, and you have another enzyme, which changes it into another form of the chemical, which then can cause a response in all these different areas around your body. So all of this is a molecular system of turning things on, and it's going to involve many systems throughout your body. Again, super complicated. And when you look at all these different things that have to interact, it's no wonder that your blood pressure, um, you like the medications for high blood pl pressure are the most prescribed medications because it's so easy, especially in older age, for some of these things to no longer um, work properly and maintain homeostasis. So another very common example is glucose levels. Your pancreas is going to monitor your blood sugar levels, and if it gets too high, you have beta cells in your pancreas, which are going to release the insulin hormone, which helps open channels and cell membranes to bring the sugar into the cells. If your blood sugar gets too low, your pancreas talks to your alpha cells, which releases glucagon hormone, which then goes um, to the liver and helps break down stored glycogen that ends up sending glucose back into the bloodstream. So again, you have these negative feedback mechanisms that are have to work together at a huge level um, throughout the body in order to keep things within a range. Again, this is showing the same idea here. You have a range. And again, you have to just pay attention to which direction the arrows are going. If it's getting too high, the pancreas releases insulin, which causes the liver and cells to take up glucose. If it gets too low, now instead of going back this way, we go this way. So it gets too low, the pancreas releases glucagon, which breaks down. Help tell It's a hormone to tell um, different things within your liver to break down the stored glycogen back into glucose and release it back into the blood, which would bring it back within the range. Again, another classic example here would be calcium. Your parathyroid hormone or parathyroid gland um, with which is specialized cells within your thyroid gland, which is kind of sits like a bow tie in your neck. Um, they're going to release hormones um, that are going to keep the calcium level at the correct amount. So if the thyroid gland is going to release calcitonin, which is going to speak to the bones, which is going to deposit calcium salt in the bones, which would bring the amount of calcium in your blood down. Now, your parathyroid gland would re release parathyroid hormone if the calcium gets too low. That parathyroid hormone is going to interact with your bones, your kidneys, and your small intestine um, to ultimately absorb, increase absorption of cal calcium from what you're eating. Um, it's going to also increase calcium reabsorption in your kidneys. Um, so then you're not peeing out excess calcium and it's going to actually cause your bones to start breaking down to increase the amount of calcium in your blood. And again, it's this constant fluctuation to keep the amount of calcium at a um, proper level. Again, a big part of this is being able to not necessarily memorize any kind of negative feedback loop, but read the loops, read the models, read the diagrams, and be able to figure out what is going on. So if you see something like this, normal blood calcium level, how is that main that range maintained through negative feedback? Well, there's a lot of different systems involved here and hormones being released throughout your blood um, to speak to other areas of your body, and everything is communicating through shape and through chemistry. So in addition to negative feedback, and again, when you hear negative feedback, you're thinking about maintaining the range. There is also positive feedback. And when you hear positive feedback, 
it's not about just bumping things up. A lot of times when people hear negative feedback, they think go down. And it's negative feedback is not go down. It means maintain the range. But positive is to escalate, enhance, or amplify a process. And we're going to look at loops with this because it's going to continue to um, accelerate a process until it can be completed quickly, typically. So this would be one example of a positive feedback system so that when an apple on a tree ripe, ripens, the ripe apple produces ethylene gas. That ethylene signals its neighbor apples to ripen, and the neighbors produce more ethylene gas, which causes more apples to ripen, which produce more ethylene gas, which causes more apples to ripen. And it is reinforcing this loop, and all of a sudden, all the tr apples are going to ripen. Another way to look at this is um, like the clotting of a wound through platelets. So wounded tissue releases chemicals. The chemicals signal platelet activation, which causes platelets to release chemicals, which causes chemicals to signal platelet activation, which continues on and on and on until the wound clots. It, the response reinforces the stimulus, which amplifies the response, and it continues on and on and on. So again, we often look at these as loops instead of kind of like an hourglass. It's it's reinforcing. So the question here says, why aren't the numbers in a normal clockwise pattern? So if you notice here, it goes one, two, three, and then four is down here. Instead of being one, two, three, four in a normal loop, um, we have it going like this. So again, a break or tear occurs in a blood vessel wall. The positive feedback cycle or loop is initiated. Platelets adhere to the site and release chemicals. The release chemicals attract more platelets. When platelets adhere to the site, they release chemicals. The released chemicals attract more platelets, and it continues looping, looping, looping chemicals, platelets, chemicals, platelets, chemicals, platelets, until a plug is formed and the blood vessel leaking is stopped. Another way to think about a, another common example of a positive feedback loop is during childbirth. So the brain stimulates the pituitary gland to release to secrete oxytocin. Oxytocin is carried in the bloodstream to the uterus. The oxytocin stimulates contractions, which sends um, the baby towards the cervix and towards um, being born, but then we continue on. The head of the baby pushes against the cervix, which then sends another message. The nerve impulses from the cervix up to the brain, and the brain sends out oxytocin. The oxytocin goes to the uterus. That causes contractions. It pushes against the cervix. The cervix sends a message to the brain, which releases more oxytocin. The oxytocin goes to the uterus, causes more contractions. It pushes against the cervix. The cervix sends a message back to the brain, and it continues this loop, 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 loop until the baby can be born. Similar thing here with lactation. The suckling of the cow sends a signal up to the brain, and again, this is coming all the way back to the very beginning here. This is a huge system level um, signal pathway. This isn't just, it happens at a cellular level, but it's communicating over great distances. So we have this message getting sent up and making a bridge between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus is receiving the information, sending messages to the pituitary gland, which releases hormones out through the blood, which sends it down to the mammary gland, which sends the suckling, causes a stimuli, which gets received by the hypothalamus, which shocks to the pituitary gland, which releases more hormones. And that oxytocin, again, is triggering um, these alveoli in the mammary glands to release more milk. And we continue in this loop. But ultimately, we 
this video is focused on response to stimuli at a system or tissue level through both negative and positive feedback. We're responding to messages and tissues at a huge level have to work together.